I am Michael Moore. Welcome, everyone. On uh, today's podcast, I have with me a special guest, uh, one of our great uh, writers, journalists, authors uh, in this country. Her name is Rebecca Traster, and I was going to have her on because of a piece that she wrote recently about how much she's always disliked Joe Biden for decades. <laughs> and in this piece in New York Magazine, she talked about the conflict that uh, she seemed to be having with the fact that she was being very pleasantly surprised by much of what he was doing. And how could this be? And it's a fascinating piece. And so I wanted to have her come on and talk about it. So she did, and you will hear her very shortly here. But somewhere after about, I don't know, 40, 45 minutes, I switched the subject to a different topic. And I don't know what I was thinking. Maybe we would talk about this for five or 10 minutes and wrap up the show. But we went on for another 45 uh, minutes. And it was, wow. And I thought to myself, well, I've just done two separate podcasts with Rebecca Tracer. And I don't think we've done this before in the 203 episodes that we've done of Rumble, but I just said, we do, we've, these are separate podcasts. And so there's going to be a part one and a part two. Part one is what you're going to hear right now with um, Rebecca and I talking about Biden, what's going on in the country, et cetera, et cetera. And then next week, I will bring you the part two that was a, um, a very good but difficult discussion to have uh, with her. And I'm going to leave it at that and let it speak for itself when I air it next week. But what we have to talk about today is something I think it's of critical importance in terms of of getting Biden to do what uh, we elected him to do and finding the moral courage to stick to his guns when it comes to fighting these Republicans. And, you know, it's not everything that we want, obviously. And, you know, he's not me, he's probably not you. But man, I have this feeling that we are... We are doing some good stuff here, and we are going to stop these Republicans from destroying this country and the planet, and I don't want to get too over-optimistic about that because it's only going to work when we all do our work, but this is a lot better than I thought it was going to be, and I want to talk about my complicated feelings about that with somebody else who has complicated feelings about it, and that's Rebecca Traster. So we're going to join her in uh, just a second here for part one, but before we do that, I just wanted to thank, we have another new underwriter, and I love it when I get these underwriters that are doing the things <laughs> that I so want to see done, and in this case, the underwriter is a, an entity called Truebill. It's actually an app. Have you heard of this? This is like the genius idea, okay? So think about this. How many times have you thought, man, I've got a lot of subscriptions. How many things have I subscribed to? Or how many streaming services am I on? I thought I was going to only join like one. You know, now I've got, I don't know how many I have. I've lost track. And when you sign up, they automatically renew you. So you never really, you don't get like a bill in the mail back in the old days. You know, And then you could decide, yes, do I want another year of Newsweek? I don't think so. And that's that. But that's not the way it works now. Now you, you sign up for a free trial subscription. And then you go and you sign up and then you realize, wait, when I'm still on that? I'm still getting that magazine. I don't even read it. Or do I really need five different streaming services? Seriously? Well, Truebill, they came up with this idea where they help you not only identify all this stuff you subscribe to, be it a print magazine, online magazine, online newspaper, a streaming service. They also help you stop paying for these subscriptions that you no longer need. You don't want them anymore. You've forgotten about them. You forgot you got sucked in by that, that offer. So I saw the statistic the other day that said 80% of people have subscriptions that they have forgotten about. And 40% of people recently said that they are overwhelmed 
by the number of subscriptions they pay for. The other 60% probably forgot they subscribed in the first place. So listen, my friends, if you are suffering from way too many subscriptions, the excessive subscription syndrome, there is a way out. Let Truebill, the Truebill app, do the work for you and set you free. Average users of this actually end up saving over $700 a year. So, my friends, in order to start canceling your unused subscriptions, you need to go to truebill.com slash rumble. You got to do the slash rumble because this tells them that it was a good idea to support this podcast and to support my voice. Truebill.com slash rumble. And now, let's rumble. Rebecca Traster, my guest today, is one of our great writers on politics, gender, media, and culture for the past several years. Her books include Big Girls Don't Cry, The Election That Changed Everything for American Women, all the Single Ladies, Unmarried Women, and the Rise of an Independent Nation. And her most recent book was Good and Mad, The Revolutionary Power of Women's Anger. She currently writes for New York Magazine, where she's written some of the most thought-provoking essays about the Me Too reckoning post-Harvey Weinstein. And her most recent piece, which I just found to be incredible and, and really fit in with what a lot of us have been talking about here on this podcast in the the last few months. And uh, that piece, if you want to look it up, and actually I'll have a link to it right here on my podcast uh, platform page. Uh, The piece is called Biden's Big Left Gamble. The president is overseeing a sea change in the world of economic policy, and so much hangs in the balance. That is very true. I'm also very pleased Uh, to finally welcome to this podcast somebody that I admire a great deal and love reading her writing. Uh, Please welcome to Rumble, Rebecca Traster. Rebecca, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to finally be here. I'm happy that it has happened now, especially after this piece that you wrote, uh, where you are sort of pleasantly surprised (laughs) as to how Joe Biden, who has been, if I may say this, on the wrong side, mostly the wrong side, of most of the critical issues of the past, uh, well, let's just give it 50 years, and how he's governing and what's been happening. And I've said this before on my podcast that, you know, the political winds uh, have been shifting uh, to the left, and Biden has been blowing along with it. I've also said to people, and I don't know this for a fact, please don't think that I'm in daily communication with anybody that knows anything, but knowing uh, Bernie, I get this feeling that that, uh, he and Biden are on the phone every other night, like they're having some kind of, you know, good night talk with each other, because Biden seems to have, as has the country, shifted to the left, that we haven't shifted right, we've gone left, but tell me what pleased you with Joe Biden's uh, performance, and I mean, how can any of us who are of of a certain age, we remember what happened to Anita Hill in those hearings, Yeah, what happened to Anita Hill was probably the formative political or feminist experience of my life. I was in high school Mm. because I think to some degree my feeling about how Biden's doing could be framed as pleasant surprise. So, and I should say, I was very publicly and aggressively a critic of Joe Biden and his entry into the 2020 right. race. But I wrote a probably 3,000 word argument against Joe Biden based on his history yes. um, with regard not only to his handling of the Thomas hearings, um, but his history writing the crime bill as, as a supporter of welfare reform, um, as, a, as a former supporter of the Hyde Amendment and a, an a abortion mm. opponent who had evolved, right, already by 2019. But I wrote this in 2019 at the beginning of that primary season. To me, and I, this was not a secret, I didn't, I'm not like, I get to be an opinion writer, but it's not like I had one candidate. I preferred a lot of the candidates who were to the left. And I, I wrote most extensively about Elizabeth Warren. She's somebody I've profiled over and over again for years. But, and, you know, I don't think anybody, I write about 
my politics, like I was preferring the candidates who were to the left. But the person who I was aggressively critical of in print was Joe Biden, because I thought he represented our past and not our future. And I couldn't have been more public about that. And my criticism of him persisted through 2020, through the um, primaries. Um, on the day that he was inaugurated, or at least that week, I wrote in New York Magazine a column um, that was sort of coming to terms with how much I had not wanted him to be the president and how grateful I was that he was becoming the president. Both things were true, right? I obviously desperately wanted him to win with every, I probably had never wanted anybody to win the presidency more <laughs> on some sick level, right? right? Um, and so I wrote a piece about him on, you know, at, at the moment of his inauguration in January after, you know, January 6th and everything, where I was trying to reckon with some of my own level of relief and also sadness that this is what the answer had to be. And in part, what I wrote in that piece was, uh, was about the kind of middling white patriarchy, the middle of the road, moderate white patriarchy that Joe Biden embodied. And I wrote in that piece, and it's a grim piece. It is, it's, it's wrestling with my, what I believe is the revelation that of course he was the person who was going to win right? Who should have, like all my argument, it shouldn't be Joe Biden. Like it was the guy who looked like the past that, I mean, I don't know, we can't run an alternate experience where it was Bernie or it was Warren or it was Castro or, you know, or it was Booker. Like we can't, we can't right. know how that would have turned out, but that the comfort that I saw people taking in Biden, uncle, the uncle Joe stuff, right. Yeah. Um, permitted him to win this most crucial of victories. And I like, that's hard for me to come to terms with because I both acknowledge that it's true. And I find it deeply, deeply depressing. Right. Because mm -hmm. a lot of what I care about is not better representation just for the sake of representation, but more diverse and progressive representation. And he does still seem like the past. And what I said in that piece at his inauguration is that I wanted him to take all the energies, the kind of more activist, more forward thinking, more youthful, more diverse perspectives in his party and more broadly on the American left and put them to use. And I sort of was a little sad and saying, like, I know that he'll get the credit. Like, I want him to be FDR. I want him to be, go big, right? Go big or go home and take the credit for the work of all these other people. And so this piece is actually looking at some of the people he has, in fact, brought on. And so here's my pleasant surprise. It's not exactly surprise at Biden himself, but it, a series of choices that he's made, I think, are terrific. And a lot of them are about hiring. A lot of them are about who he's built his administration around, not necessarily his inner circle, who are a lot of the the people who like him have been in democratic politics and you know for over decades and but he has staffed his teams and i'm writing largely in this piece about economic policy teams with really creative forward looking young diverse perspectives uh, that are very exciting and i think actually building policy that then the questions about whether or not that policy makes it through a, a very broken Senate process and, and congressional process, like that, putting that aside, he has brought on a really remarkable team and that makes all the difference in the world. And so that's sort of what I'm, this piece is describing some of that, right? How this process is happening and how this generation of people who I think do think very differently than Joe Biden has either thought or legislated throughout his five decade career that we've known him for, right? Um, he actually was elected before I was born. He was elected, I was born in 1975 and Joe Biden was elected in 72 and, and came to the Senate in January of 73. So, um, you know, I, I, that's what this piece is doing is trying to figure out what's the match here? Why did he do this thing? Why did he, why did he build an administration and at least in part, not entirely, um, of these really dynamic, in some cases, forward looking people who see government in a different way. And, and some of the pieces wrestling with what about Joe Biden leaves him, op makes him open to that kind of generational and ideological shift that I think we're seeing. The thing about Biden that has been surprising and cheering to me, because I think he very well could have governed in the ways that would have matched my worst guesses about him, which would be in the spirit of the 1990s uh, Clintonian into Obama years, you know, sort of centrist neoliberal cowering position of 
what had been until very recently the, the contemporary Democratic Party. And I assumed that that was how he would govern. Um, and he certainly has elements of that around him. But he has stocked his, like his administration, in some cases the cabinet, but, but also the kind of two and three levels down into his administration with a really fascinating group of people. And, and the piece that I wrote a few weeks ago was largely about, you know, a kind of economic policy um, side of things. I think it's, in some cases, it's true around immigration and climate. We'll see. But, you know, he's, br- he's brought a really surprising group of people who are a lot younger, a lot more progressive, um, a lot more diverse um, in, in their thinking, um, as well as in terms of their identities and, and, and their ages than, than I might have expected. And I think you can see that reflected in the policy um, that they're making, whether or not that policy gets through and whether or not Biden and the senior Democrats actually know how to fight for that policy successfully. And if there is a path to fight for it successfully, these are all open questions. But a lot of what he's putting on the table is a lot more dynamic, a lot lefter um, than I would have guessed. Uh, and so the thing that I am pleasantly surprised by is his openness to a new generation of economic thinking and ideo- and, and ideology and political and approach to politics and framing of the government, which I think is really important. He's really open to new ways to cast the role of government as a beneficial force in people's lives. And I think that is so crucial and it's been missing for my, you know, entire adulthood, <laughs> uh, pr- practically my entire life from the Democratic Party is a willingness to sort of aggressively say the government is is a salubrious force, should be a salubrious force, should act to bring support, st- economic stability, health care, dignity to the lives of, of people in this country. Um, and, and, and he's brought in a group of people who I think think differently about that, and he's permitting them to shape policy. Um, and and that's, that's very interesting to me. And so my piece was, was noting that, and then um, also exploring what's made him open to this path and to this sort of new generation of people. And there are all kinds of people who have hypotheses about what about Biden makes him a good match for some of these younger people um, and the ideas that have come up through decades of activism that's been happening sort of outside the Democratic Party. Um, and then that has you know, taken yeah. shape within the Democratic Party electorally and has also happened within realms of economic policy. My theory policy. is it's the ice cream. I, there's just, <laughs> you know, I think it's, I've always <laughs> felt that ice cream was one of the few things that we have of maybe perhaps some proof of a, of a higher power uh, on this, because <laughs> no human could ever <laughs> invent something that good. That's just, and it, this guy is nuts <laughs> about his ice cream and, and the ice cream in the cone. Especially, but I've also said yeah. somewhat seriously that um, having been raised Catholic and being a, a recovering Catholic at this point, I guess, uh, this guy, uh, his religion, his faith, however he, whatever, however he fashions it, he's the first president in my lifetime that doesn't fake go to church. That he really is going <laughs> to mass. Mm-hmm. And there's something about it that, and perhaps it, it, it has, you know, been affected by the losses in his life, maybe this final loss with his his uh, son. That and so I've seen this happen with people sometimes where they it's not just about going and kneeling and saying prayers and all this, but it's really about the, how how can I leave this world a better place. And, and and do it not just in my name, but my son's name, and in the others who've suffered, and 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 I, I sense this in him. I also, it's these uh, his other advisors, his three granddaughters. I I think that they mm-hmm. have uh, just having read and seen interviews with them, they have made their voices as young women heard loudly uh, and forcefully with him about some things. And I just I, maybe it's a combination of all of this. I don't. I don't know. Right now, I don't know if I want to know because today, Rebecca, today he is still yeah. pushing for the over three trillion dollar, what he calls the human yeah. infrastructure. He won't let up on it. Sure. They've told him to stop. Mansion has threatened him. You got to stop this, or I'm going. Oh, you know, Mansion shows up at a 
GOP fundraiser this past weekend in Texas, you know, and he doesn't, you said the modern Democrat, as you were describing uh, this, this group of people, the Democrats is always giving in, afraid of Republicans, afraid of the word liberal. Remember, you couldn't use that word. Oh, oh yeah. 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 So, so this is the, these are the Democrats that we've grown up with and as adults just, just hated it. And he's not doing that. He's not giving up. He's still just, and every day, because, you know, I'm like you with this, and I'm like, oh, I knew he'd give up on that, you know? And then all of a sudden, he uh-huh. comes back today, he goes, hey, what about my $3 trillion for child care and, and, right. and all this other stuff that we've got to do? This is, this is infrastructure, too, and I'm not going to let you define it. I'm defining it, because I know this is what the majority of Americans want. And, and, and I think that, the, A, we cannot understate how remarkable it is to have a president pushing for that care economy yes. stuff. I mean, and, uh, you know, I- I'm of the mind that the reframing it as infrastructure brilliant. is brilliant. There are lots of very smart people who no, disagree with I me agree. about that. But um, I think it's it's brilliant and it is a way to take something that for years has been siloed as a women's issue and, in fact, um, and, and sort of <laughs> find a kind of... M- unfortunately masculinized framework that thereby legitimizes it right in the infrastructure but it's also correct they're the systems that need to work in order for people to live the lives they want right, to right. live you know and and need to live and um so i think the infrastructure framing is brilliant i want to go back to the theorizing yeah. about what it is because you said a couple of yeah. things that are very interesting to me so i i this wasn't in my piece but a couple of people mentioned it to me and i think it's absolutely true the close relationship with the granddaughters i mm-hmm. think is really important because he does seem to have a lot of his inner circle in the white house are people yeah. who've been with him for decades right and a lot of yeah. guys who like him eh, old white guys yes. who've been around for a long time um but but he has clearly a very close familial relationship with these yes. young women. Um, the the thing you said about his religion, of course, to my mind, cuts in several directions. And it may be true that that his faith guides him. It's certainly true that his experiences of loss, um, you know, beginning with the death of of his wife and and child, and it, his his own experience. And this is probably not separate from his understanding of the role that care work plays within the lives of family, his experiences of raising his sons um, for a period as a single dad, um, up through the loss of Bo, uh, you know, and, and, his, and, and his son's struggle with addiction. All these kinds of things um, give him an ex- experience of loss, pain, and, and what you need and the resources that you need at hand to rebuild and, and stabilize. Um, I think all that's that's really true and makes him empathetic. But he's also had all those experiences um, in, uh, you know, remember, he'd had those experiences right. when he supported that's welfare right. reform. Right. Crime so it, that gets us part yeah. of the way. But it doesn't it, it doesn't take us all the way there. And of course, the religion itself is what led to decades of his um you know, abortion. stance on abortion, which I, and I have to say this, among the biggest surprises of this administration and something I care deeply about and that I just have to take my hat off, this budget, the proposed budget, was the first since I believe Clinton's first budget in the early 90s that did not include the Hyde Amendment. Now, the Hyde will certainly go back into the finished product, but the fact that Joe Biden, who for years um, was an opponent of abortion, and a supporter of the Hyde Amendment took the Hyde Amendment out, the legislative rider that forbids uh, pregnant people from from using it, who who avail themselves of government uh, insurance to use that government insurance to pay for abortion care, which is um, unbelievably discriminatory, racist, uh, like one of the the most unequalizing laws in this country. Um, it's it's foul in every way, and it's just it's been so absorbed as as that I believe Barack Obama referred to it as a tradition. Mm. Um, and the fact that Biden was the person who submitted a proposed budget that didn't have it in, I, I just have to take right. my hat off to him uh, because that, that shows change that I really admire. And that is about an ability to evolve. And it's about perhaps listening to people and taking them really seriously and thinking about how, um, what faith, compassion, dignity, loss, equality, um, 
taking a look at, at structural inequalities like he says he's doing, how that can reshape our ideas and lead us to change our minds, which is what we want from people. There are also more cynical views of this, which is that Biden, the thing about Biden is he is a classic right, politician, right? right? <laughs> He's the right. guy, like he is the retail politician. He's the guy holding babies and shaking hands in a non-COVID era, right? He's the, he's that guy. And that guy can lead a lot of us to distrust him for very good reason. But there's also something, and, and Dorian Warren said to me when I interviewed right. him for this piece, he's like, we actually want our politicians to respond to our pressure, right? We want them to take the temperature, to put their finger in the wind and see which way the wind is blowing. And it's the job of activists, whether that means outside sort of street activism, whether it means activism within a democratic party, or whether it means activism within like nerd world of economic policy expertise, it's our job to change the way the wind is blowing. And, and decades worth of activism, whether it's Occupy and Fight for 15 and Black Lives Matter and Me Too, whether it's Bernie and the Squad and the Elizabeth Warren sort of more regulatory approach, um, whether it's this shift in economic policy thinking that I was sort of describing in this piece among a bunch of nerds who were traumatized by the slow recovery coming out of 2008, who were informed by the activism of Occupy, Black Lives Matter, to rethink a Democratic Party's approach to economic policy, and now are working within this guy's administration, he's being affected by all, all of that it. kind yes, of stuff, all of it. right? And he's shifting. Yeah. And I think that's a really important quality. And then the, the other theory that Felicia Wong, who's the head of the Roosevelt Institute, said to me that's very funny and lots of people notice, but I think there's actually something interesting that I, I think you might be interested in too. She said, it was kind of a joke and kind of not. She's like, he's so old. Right? Some of the reasons I thought he was the party's past and not his future. He's so old that he's actually pre-neoliberal, <laughs> right? That he came of age. Biden no, didn't. Right. It's true. He came of age, politically even, in adulthood, amongst the remnants of right. a New Deal coalition, right? right? He knows, you know, I, I mean, I think there are, there are all kinds of arguments to be had about his actual commitments to labor, but he, he sees himself as a union guy. And he came of political age in a period where he understood that there was a different way for, Democratic, for Democrats to govern. And he was then a part of the party and a foot soldier of the party that decided to do it differently, being led by Wall Street and markets over a period of four decades. But he has the experience, the lived experience of a very different right. approach to democratic right. policymaking. And so some of this stuff may not be the way I understand it. It's like, it's new and he's open to new young ideas. And Felicia Wong's model is like, these are old ideas, you know? And he, he obviously knows that. That's, he talks about Roosevelt all the time. You know, the biggest portrait it's, it's in his Roosevelt. office is, yeah. is yeah, yeah. FDR. That's yeah. his model. That's an old model of democratic of policy. Cesar Chavez and Bobby Kennedy. Right. I mean, um, uh, Rosa Parks. This right, this, and he also, the the thing about, well, I just want to say, uh, sorry, I don't I'll go back to this Catholic thing again, but last month, mm -hmm. this guy, who supported the Hyde Amendment, all anti-abortion, blah blah blah, all through all these decades, and now he's been declared an enemy of the Catholic Church by mm -hmm. yeah. the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. They have voted. To uh, to deny him to go to communion uh, when he goes to mass, they've never done that to anybody, and I think it's because they see him as a threat. He's probably their biggest for all. Now we're talking about all the bad things that the Catholic Church does to this planet, uh, to this country, to women, uh, to uh, uh, the LGBTQ community, etc. They 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 are probably responsible for so many deaths. If you lay at their feet. What they did to stop uh, any help going to people who had HIV and AIDS, no condom distribution was allowed. None of this stuff. Uh, if if you were a Planned Parenthood or somebody and you were distributing condoms in the third world, you didn't get any government money because of condoms, it's things that would save people's lives. Right. And they have now said that he is their enemy, their personal enemy, and they are going to deny him this thing that he actually believes <laughs> He believes that is the body of Christ, and and they are not. And I think it's because he is, and what he started out of the gate doing here, they're not stupid, and they see that his 
his values are certainly not theirs, and and they do care a lot more um, about what they uh, call the unborn than than the child who is born into poverty, into everything else, hunger, etc. Uh, the Catholic Church lost its way as an institution a long time ago, and yet he and yet like your grandparents, if you're Catholic, they still show up to mass. I don't know. I just I think that there's there is something going on here, but I just. Uh, for all, I just want to ask you this, though. For all the positive that he's doing, there's still this maddening talk that we st- we have to find common no. ground, that we have to meet in the middle. Uh. And you wrote uh, this uh, piece recently uh, titled, uh, They've Been Calling for Bloodshed the Whole Time, mm-hmm. talking about the right wing and how they've supported violence for years now. This is a party that has built its power on violence and the call for bloodshed, be it invading another country, being it not uh, repassing the uh, Violence Against Women's Act, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is in their core belief system. And so, so my question to you is, how are we supposed to meet in the middle? Yeah, there's no middle. That's horseshit. And so, but here's probably why I'm not a politician, much less the president of the United States. I mean, I think it's horseshit. And I think it's been, I think, treating this kind of, this, it, it all goes hand in hand with Democrats' stated commitments to civility, which go back, you know, like, I mean, for a long time. But this whole notion that the system worked, I mean, and that is something that I will still work up ahead of steam about with Biden and his stories of the Senate and his, he fought like cats and dogs on the floor with the segregationists. And then you'd go and, you know, have lunch or have go to beer. the gym or whatever. Fuck that. I mean, right, the system worked because you're the people in power in the system and you're you're the system and your fights actually are legislating the realities of the people out there. So it's working for you because you get your lunch, right? But it's not working, right? So I am allergic to the, and I, I mean, I remember in Oh, gosh, I've I've lost what year we're in, but in the period of the the child separation and and the the summer, um, I guess it was twenty seventeen yeah. or twenty eighteen. Um, you know when you had Pelosi and you had people calling for like civility and stop interrupting mm. their date nights and dinners with yes. protesters. I, sh- Fuck that. I am, but, but listen, that is a perspective that is very much on the side of a kind of stirred fury and protest culture that I actually believe, right? There's, there are all kinds of different schools of thought on this, right? But I think it's the culture of protest and the, and the interrupting of the dinners of the people who were, who are ripping families apart at the border, right? And the, the stuff that is deemed by many in power, including ostensibly on the side of, you know, on, in the Democratic Party, right? Definitely in the Democratic Party and ostensibly on the side of the greater moral good saying, no, 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 we can't, this is, we need to be civil in our discussions. We need to work together. We need to, right. I'm on the side of fuck that, protest them. However, I will also say that there are these kinds of challenges and the expression of changing ideas come in many forms. And some of those forms are street protest. Some of those forms are demonstrations. Some of those forms are interrupting the dinners of, of administration officials, right? Some of those forms are profane. And then they may not you know, that's not working with, that's not the system working, right? It's not the legislators having their lunches together, right? In fact, it's those lunches or the equivalent being disturbed. But that's part of the the work of, again, activism that happens in many, takes many different forms at many different times, you know? That's different from some of the, it's distinct from some of the voter registration efforts, the, the voter protection movements mm-hmm. we've seen happen. Um but yet these things are all different forms of expression of dissatisfaction with the right. system, right? And that disfattis- dissatisfaction is finding, in ve- albeit in very, again, very different forms, 
it's finding its way into that Biden administration. So if you don't have a culture that is mad enough to interrupt dinners four or five summers ago, or whenever, again, I've lost time. I don't, I can't tell you what year it is. I can't tell you what day it is, but I definitely know that several summers ago. <laughs> We're two years before having Medicare for every person in this country. Free, free health care for everyone. <laughs> we're, two, we're in that year that's two years before that. I don't know the number of the year either, right. but I know where I'm at. <laughs> right. But s- several years past, you had Maxine Waters, who has always been on the side of protest and the ex- protest as a valid and cogent expression of dissatisfaction at injustice. You had Maxine Waters encouraging protest and you had a, the members of her own party, Schumer and Pelosi, chastising yes. her for it, calling for civility. And right, and there are those disagreements coming from the system versus a, versus outside of a system, you know? And and yet the outside of the system beha- like things that we saw contributed to a greater cultural and and to all of us knowing that we What's happening around us is wrong. And there are people mad enough to say it in whatever form it takes. And of course, that is true when it comes to issues that's, that's border issues and immigration issues and it's climate and it is climate protests and it is the, the sit-in in Pelosi's office the first day of the, that, that first day Congresswoman, uh, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez attends, right? When she first comes to Washington, um, you know, in January of 2019, right? That's protest that happened within the system. All of this gets to Joe yes. Biden eventually, yes. right? That's part of what shifts. That's the wind. That's that's Dorian Warren's. It's our job to shift the wind. And some of that is that impolite stuff. It's sitting, you know, it's interrupting dinners or it's doing a sit-in in Nancy Pelosi's office. Or it's AOC running to to unseat a Democrat who's been sitting in his seat for a long time and she unseats him and and then she's at Nancy Pelosi's door too alongside protesters and I mean this is all part of the larger yes, system of changing the wind that. yes yes but, so but here's my fear if the Senate if we don't end the, the filibuster in the Senate and for instance get these voting rights bills passed mm-hmm. nothing else is going to matter we Correct. may we might be on the path to being a, a permanent minority rule country. Does, do you think mm-hmm. Biden, does he have an end game here with the mansions and the cinemas of this world? If uh, I understood the inner, see, one yeah. of the things is that I have almost no access to the inner, like I, I, I'm taking, the, the reason that when I wrote this piece about what's going on within the, you know, within a Biden ep- economic policy team, talking to people, some inside and some outside his administration. I, I am so distant from what is going on in the head of Joseph Robinette Biden, I can't even tell you, right? Like, it's a, he is a complete mystery to me. He is a, he's a president-shaped president. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I am very interested in what this president-shaped president is doing, and, I t- and I'm very open to all kinds of guesses about why he's doing it. And, and some of them may be sort of guessing at like his psychology and his experience of loss, or he's really old and is pre-neoliberal, or he's listening to young people. But the sort of, does he have a plan with mansion and cinema? How could anybody have a plan with mansion and cinema is my first question. Again, this is why I'm not a politician and not the president, because I'm like, how do you deal with it? I mean, like, th- I, I get sort of mad from the outside, like, get your people, collect, come on, Schumer, come on, Biden, like, Collect your people. Get them under control. Right. You know, McConnell wouldn't let this happen. So, but but then I think, what do you do? These uh, mansion and cinema, you know, this is a degree of malevolence that, mm. what do you do? How do you fight it? Mm. So I don't, I wouldn't have, I don't have a plan. My pl- you know, my plan from the outside is pull it together, people. Be a, be a party. Be a party with a tiny majority that is one health crisis away from, it's not a real majority. Right. Yeah. And I mean, even in numbers, it is one health crisis away from a minority. I have one idea of how I think he could do it. Okay. But it's, it is the, again, it's old school politics <laughs> <laughs> and not the kind that we like. But uh, I remember Lyndon Johnson getting all those Southern Democrats uh, to vote for the civil rights uh, bill and all of that. And he just brought them in one by one, you know, and I don't know, he was like six, five or whatever. And just, towered over them and just got out his finger and wagged it at him and said, this is what you're going to do. But I don't like that. I'm not suggesting that by now. Well, there's also, I mean, what is, 
what is who's who's their god, right? Because I don't know, maybe the I Democrats am Democrats God. Yeah, because whose mansion's God? Because oh, I know what it is. What, I know what it's it is. money. Money, right? You go, you bring them in, and you buy them off. You go old school on this, and you buy them. You don't buy them off by getting mansion, a yacht, and cinema, right. some resort property in Mexico. That's not how you do it. You they want to get reelected, and the best way to do that is just have them come in and just say. Tell me whatever it is you need for West Virginia. What do you need for Arizona? Right. You talk about pork. I've got so much pork to give you. It's it's limitless. And so what can I do? And who would be opposed, actually, to making West Virginia a better state, better for its poor people? Uh, Arizona. Just say, what do you need? Because we need your votes to get this voting rights thing passed. We need to pass this infrastructure stuff. And you've got to do this. And, and I am willing to give you things that are not in this budget. I'm going to put them in the budget, and I'm going to tell all the other Democrats they've got to vote for it. Just make your list. Give me the list. Just give me the list. Does this sound, does this sound like, Mike, don't go back to those days. Don't do that. Right. right. No, I mean, I don't, I don't love that. I don't love any of this, right? <laughs> right. So here's the most optimistic guess about what we can say about what his strategy is. It is exactly how we got into this portion of the conversation, which is, let's find common ground. It is a fan dance, right? And, I mean, because there's part of me that's like, Christ, this can't be real, right? You were... Obama's vice president. You lived through this. You know who these people, like, who the opposition party is. What are you talking about, let's find common ground? This is performance art here at this point, right? I mean, I think that that's the only answer as to what is this guy doing, right? I'm really just throwing things at the wall, hoping no, something I know, will me stick. Too, but because we cannot not have these bills passed. They have to pass. Uh, otherwise, uh, he will not win re-election. Um, a lot of people who came out to vote this last time had never voted before. And they came out to get rid of Trump. Now they've got to come out to keep Biden, and he's got to give them a reason to keep. That's why the voting rights thing has to pass. That's why these things to help uh, children and other, other, you know, the, the living wage, everything that makes life better for, for the average working person in this country um, is, is so important. If, this doesn't, if the Democrats don't do this, I'm afraid that we will continue to have, you know, when you— when the minority rule against what the majority want, you know, we know what that's called. They don't, yes. they don't have the power. The power of the country rests with the people who believe in civil rights, women's rights, gay rights, etc. All that stuff. That's where the majority of us are at. For that to be denied uh, to us by this minority of politicians who do not represent anywhere near the majority of this country, but this is, this is, we have been, we are deluding ourselves if we think that the, my, the condition of minority rule is a future. This is the past. Remember, right? We have had, Donald Trump is not the first minority rule president, right? Right, right. You know, George Bush won with a minority. And by the way, it was, I mean, think about how this happened. You know, Trump loses the popular vote. He wins the presidency thanks to the Electoral College, which is, you know, designed originally to suppress majority opinion, right? That's, right. that's part of the Electoral College's design is minority rule, right? And it wor- has worked um, in a couple of instances. <laughs> um, he also, that mi- the minority of the, you know, Barack Obama, a popularly elected president twice, has his judicial appointments blocked by Mitch McConnell over the course of eight years, including a Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court justices, the court that's going to decide, you know, and you can, huh, voting, abortion, labor, climate, like health care, all of it, our 6-3 court. Hmm. Those justices have been appointed by presidents in Donald Trump and George Bush who didn't win the majority of American voters. And yet they have appointed the majority of justices. So minority rule is our condition over the past few decades. That's how we are where we are. It's how we got the court that that gutted 
the Voting Rights Act to begin with in 2013, right? Right. Also, remember that those justices themselves, right? Isn't it true that Amy Coney Barrett and Kavanaugh both worked on the um, Bush v. Gore? Her, Roberts, and Kavanaugh. Yeah. All worked three, a third of the Supreme Court yeah. actually worked on the legal team that helped George W. Bush win the presidency despite losing the, the, the majority of votes. Right, right. No, this is, this is why when we call this democracy now, everything has gone upside down here and, and nothing seems real. I mean, we were joking, talking about, you know, the COVID fog that we're all in. But I, th- I think that's just a way we're just trying to laugh off the fact that we, that we somehow, once again, it seems like we may have won, but we're losing. And it's, it's well, uh, I mean, you've written about, you know, the, the number of women that have gotten elected here in, this, in the last decade or so. But nonetheless, you know, we're only at 25% of Congress is, is, are oh, women. Yeah. <laughs> they are the majority gender. And and yet and yet you control twenty five percent of the power. Uh, Historians won't look kindly upon us for celebrating the fact that we got twenty five percent of Congress is now women. <laughs> this is like anybody who thinks this job is over. It's like this is. Anyways, I just looked this up. I, I just found it here. A few weeks ago, they had a vote in Congress to form an official January sixth commission to investigate uh, the uh, the uprising, and. The vote was 54 in favor of forming the commission, 35 against, and the 35 won because of this crazy thing that, oh, Bill must have 60 votes, otherwise we're afraid we'll be filibustered and somebody will have to talk on the floor for 10 hours. And this has got to stop. I mean, I just, I don't know what to say. I'm I'm just so, I'm not the only one. People are livid about this. But, you know, I, I, the the other thing I wanted to say here to you is that, um, so you've written this thing about, um, you know, you know, with all with all the caveats and all the you know things mm-hmm. that I say when I say these things about Biden, uh, but I have friends <laughs> uh, on the left. I don't know if that's surprising or not, um, and they ref- <laughs> they refuse to celebrate anything positive that's happened during the first six uh, months or so of this of this presidency. I mean, if nothing else, the child tax credit, this thing can be huge. No. huge. If nothing else, it's huge. It's, it's huge. huge. It, it and, has and, to be made permanent. I'm going to like challenge Rosa DeLauro, who's been fighting for the expansion of this tax credit for like 20 years. But it has to be made permanent. And this is permanent. actually a piece. Okay, I'm not, ta- I'm not speaking about the execution. There are a lot of things. Some of the people who are in deepest poverty, there's not, I don't know that there's, I, I, there's a lot that has to be done with a policy this big and this different from it anything we've seen before around execution and selling it and making sure people know that this is happening and that they can yes. get access to it. Um, all you of know, that, there because are all, all they, kinds they, of caveats they, about it. They talk about, oh, it'll cut child poverty in half. I, and I say, do you hear what you're saying? That this is right. why it has to be permanent. But- it has to be permanent, but with all the caveats about how it needs, and it needs to be executed well, and it needs to be made completely accessible, and people need to go into communities where they probably, are, there's not a huge amount of awareness, and, and make sure everybody knows that there's no job requirement. That I mean, it is, a, it, all of that said, this is a remarkable piece of legislation. People are going to be getting checks from the government for their children. Yes. And this is crucial, and it is huge, and I have that same issue. Look, do you have it's friends that are upset at you when you say something positive like that, though? Or? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, part of me is upset at me when I say something positive. <laughs> I get it, right? There's, uh, I understand. And by the way, one of my, you said something two minutes ago where you said the appearance that we've won when actually we're losing. There is such a delicate and terrifying balance here. One of my great fears about the level of relief I f- even I felt, me who h- hated Joe Biden, okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, for like, he, not just in the 2020 race, for years of my life, like Joe Biden was everything I didn't like about the Democratic Party. And <sighs> the relief I felt in his victory scared me a little bit mm. because I do think that all this stuff we've been talking about, the disruption, the activism, the fury, the pushing, everybody being able to see how how cruel 
and unjust things were. And and Trump shone a spotlight on that, right? And and I would like that's not like silver linings of Trump. There are no silver linings of Trump. None. None. But there was an undeniability about the venality, right? Mm -hmm. There was a visibility and a and a lack of window dressing. Right. around the malevolence, the venality, the cruelty, the bigotry, right? Mm -hmm. That made people aware. And then one of my big fears was we're going to put a president-shaped president bandage on that and we're going to feel such relief, right? And the, the relief is going to be numbing and it's going to be anesthetizing in a way that's really dangerous because it was the, it was the being asleep that, that got us to this point to begin with. Right. It was it was the passivity and the sort of like gentle feelings of relief. And I don't need to think about this anymore. And I don't need to be angry and I don't need to be unhappy. And I don't need to post 100 angry things on Facebook every day because it's Joe and it's going to be fine. That terrified me that we were actually going to be too pleased that lots of people who, you know, had spent who had been awakened to how 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 cruel so many systems in this country are. We're going to just feel like, well, now we fixed it. And they were going to go back. I mean, the joke is back to brunch. But that's a, this has been a real fear of mine. And so how do you balance that fear and wanting to keep people vigilant and wanting all your friends on the left and, and my friends and, and, and part of my brain that's like, no, come on, this is not good enough. This is like, what? What, what about climate? Where the hell are we on? The, you know, what is happening? The, there's a heat dome. All these things that are not done, that are so dissatisfying, you want to stay vigilant, you want to stay angry, and you have to because that's how you keep pushing them. But there is also the failure to acknowledge the moments that we've won. And I think it's crucial or are, have won something, right? And I think it's crucial, especially in the, in the effort to maintain vigilance and anger, to see the places where that vigilance and anger and work and effort over decades. Right has created some change. Right. It matters. I do, I do agree with that. I'm, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm saying that because I, in my lifetime, I don't want to see a Congress that's just 25% women. But at the same time, if we don't take time to celebrate these victories that we have, it's hard to keep everybody, let's, we got to keep moving folks. And it's like, man, can we just like get just a sip of water here, please? I'm in the desert. Right. You need to. And I think people who have been, a lot of these lessons are things, you know, so many people that I have written about over the past few years and who I have met and talked to and whose sort of awakenings to anger, I, I really admire, right? A lot of people who didn't think much was wrong. There's a, there's a whole population of suburban white women, upper middle class white women who were really um, awoken to injustice during the Trump years. And, you know, there are lots of cynical approaches to take to that population. There's a lot of really earnest, like, you know, this is, it's a very interesting group of people and ideas um, that I have been reporting on and, and thinking about a lot. Um, but one of the things I found is that if you do not come from a tradition of protest and struggle, right? If you are not somebody who has been engaged in those fights for most of your life, and if your parents weren't engaged, and if your grandparents weren't engaged, and if your community hasn't traditionally been engaged, and in fact, you know, has been, if you've been complacent, if you've been part of a complacent community that, you know, in fact, is on the <laughs> profitable and abusive end of, of power inequities, um, there's not a great model for how do you put everything out on the line, to fight, right? Whether that's registering voters, whether it's becoming part of, whether it's sort of awakening to various forms of injustice and, and using your resources to fight them. Um, and you, and whether it's just caring, it's just putting like, right, like people who, who care about these things know how painful it is and how often it is likely to be that you're on the losing side. If you're fighting from the outside or if you're fighting for some, the top from, you know, alongside, the bottom, right? We also have to have models for um, rest and appreciation of moments of victory and uh, joy, and joy, and fun, and communion, and and community, and coalition, and the things you get, even because there's so much loss, right? right? There's and and a lot of people who are new to activism who happen to have been like white middle class people who'd kind of been asleep 
for a lot of their lives are used to levels of comfort and also used to levels of winning. And so there, there were moments during the Trump years, like the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh came as such a shock to a lot of people, right? Who right. were out there protesting with all their heart. And then he was confirmed anyway. And it was like, what? But I, but that's not fair. It's like, right. That's the experience of protesting injustice is often having that injustice confirmed for you, you know, by losing. And so there's a lot to be learned for people who are new to this kind of engagement, but we must keep people engaged. So we have to offer models of like, yes, you got to keep working and you got to stay angry and you got to keep awake, but you also got to take your moments of pleasure and joy and, and, and affiliation and, and fun. Um, because otherwise you're going to burn out. Absolutely. It's, um, so yeah, I hope everybody took that the right way when I when I said that how much we still have to do uh, because I know I know that uh, most people these days, especially during this pandemic, are just struggling to get through day by day, and um, and don't know what's ahead. Fear what's ahead. Now we have this new variant in front of us. What will happen this winter? I mean, the fear that people have to live with now, right now, it's 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 significant. And uh, so, but at the same time. Um, when you when you say that about, uh, I assume that you have probably taken your kids to demonstrations or whatever. Did, did they, is that how you were raised? Is that did you have parents like that? I had parents who were. Is a, <laughs> I did not. I didn't have take me to demonstration. Parents. I did not grow up in a protest culture. I grew up in a house that was very left. My mother had grown up like staunch, in a staunchly Republican family on a potato farm in northern Maine. My father had grown up in a socialist household in the Bronx. Um, my mother's politics had turned left in college, and then they'd gotten married. I grew up in a left household, mm -hmm. but it wasn't a street protest household. It was a much mm -hmm. more intellectualized left household. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, sort of, I, I think the first protest I went to um, was in junior high with my friend, my, one of my best friend's mothers, who was more of a, like, it was a, it was a uh, abortion rights protest, although at that point it was probably called a pro-choice, which I hate the language of choice around abortion, but um, it was a pro-choice protest probably in 86 or something in Washington. I can't remember what year it was. And I went on a bus with my best friend and her mother. That was the first sort of, you know, entry into that world. Hmm. Um, but I grew up in a in a house that was very left politically. It just wasn't a let's go to a demonstration. My first protest actually was the same age uh, you were, uh, except it wasn't it wasn't about it was basically they used to serve this thing called Thursday surprise at lunch. Uh, it was all the <laughs> leftovers from Monday through Wednesday, and so I we organized a walk out of the cafeteria because we were sick of eating Thursday surprise. I know that's not very noble, uh, but it it you know you got to start somewhere. You got to start somewhere. And I am so happy that we started here, right here, with Rebecca Tracer uh, today, a great writer and a great conversation that we just had about where we're at right now in this country. But I couldn't let it end right there. We were not done. And that's why we're going to go to part two of this conversation next week on Rumble. And I'll give you a heads up. Rebecca, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, one of the early and original writers in the Me Too movement and trying to deal with the patriarchy and the men who make it miserable for women at work, at school, wherever. And so I started asking her about that and, and we got into talking about Harvey Weinstein. And she had had her own run-ins with him and um, he had distributed a, a couple of my movies, and we just kind of let it go. And we started talking about it. And then that led to me talking about a particular uh, individual, a man, of what I had witnessed in the office many, many years ago. And we name names, <laughs> and we get into it the it being the sexual uh, harassment and abuse of women. And boy, I'll tell you, this was some conversation to have. I wanted it to have its own episode. And we talk about what we 
still need to do, what we can do, what people can do. Um, but it became kind of a personal uh, discussion for me, and I want you to hear it. It's very powerful. And so that's what we're going to do on next week's Rumble. So join me then for part two of our episode here with Rebecca Traster. And uh, my thanks to our executive producer here today, Basil Hamden, our editor and sound engineer, Nick Quaz, and to everybody else who supports this podcast, listens to it, underwrites it. Much appreciated. There's a lot of work to do. We're the ones to do it, right? Yes. So I will look forward to joining you next week uh, here on Rumble for Part 2 with Rebecca Traster and the Harvey Weinstein Plus episode. Stay tuned for that. See you next Thursday. This is Michael Moore, and this is Rumble. I'll die as I stand here today Knowing it deep in my heart Therefore to ruin one day For making us part